I'm Dr. Kathleen Walls. And I'm Francesca Solomon. And, and you, you are, are watching, watching Dr. Walls and Friends on, on the Sisters, Sisters in Harmony Network. Network. She's here. Dr. Walls and Friends, and as promised, here I am. I have a Herman to the left of me and a Herman to the right of me, and so I'm a sister in harmony for real, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Lord, and you first. know, as I was sitting here, I said, Herman, H E R, her, M A N, man. Mm -hmm. So I guess I got her man right. next to me. That's right. So I think it's important to bring you two together, and I'm mm -hmm. fascinated by the fact that both of you are men who have been impacted by domestic violence mm -hmm. and you chose to start organizations and work with organizations with to really combat this social what do i want to call this this, this plague so, pla that's a great word thank you and so as we talk about needing to do something and stand up and that's what you talked about in the last segment was each of us doing our own part and you both are doing your own parts and in the process of doing it now you're doing it together right you know, when, when God blesses something and God puts it together the master chess player takes the pieces and we humble ourselves mm -hmm. the pieces fall in perfect alignment yes so it's just a matter of time mm -hmm. that's what it is now you you sitting over here shaking your head and I, I know you're car. in deep thought. I can car. I'm a chess player. Mm -hmm. So I get it. And um, you know, it, what's funny is that growing up I, I hated my name. Really? Only because I would I, you know, it was doing Herman Monster, Herman yeah. Catnips, yeah. and yeah. that was the era. <laughs> right. You know, and you know but yeah, you know, I would call a girl's house and it's like who's calling? I would say Herman. I said, Herman, <laughs> or, you know, 
had uh, herbs on the phone, or, you know, stuff like that. But I, 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 I love my name. Mm. Um, and then to meet another Herman mm -hmm. that um, that is doing the same kind of work and has the same kind of passion yes. for me, and I'm, I'm more in line with his passion than his mm. name. Yes. You know, because yes. um, you, you, you meet so many people. I, I meet so many people is that they have a hidden agenda and it doesn't look like mine. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, but mm. his agenda looks like my agenda. And this, you know, when I first met him, when we first introduced, when we shook hands and gave that brotherly hug, I yes. mean, the energy was right. Yes. Yeah. So no, I'm excited. And I think it's it's wonderful that 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 collaboration has occurred because mm -hmm. a lot of times as you talked about the explanation with she is me mm -hmm. a lot of times there's that competitive energy and mm -hmm. when the competitive energy is in the space not as much work can get done okay. yeah i just we, i just spoke to someone in samusha about that i've been talking about it for the last few months i tell people you know come out of the martial arts experience i come out of um, competition but i'm at the point in my life where i don't do competitions anymore mm -hmm. And the reason I don't do competition, I don't put my, I don't put my work in competition. I just, I mean, I respect them. That's what people want to do. But for me personally, I just don't do them anymore because when you do competitions, that means some part of your energy force, some part of your spiritual energy goes into trying to be better than somebody else. Mm -hmm. And I'm at the point, I'm in my point in my life right now. I don't want to try to be better than you. I want to work with you. Yes. And that's where I am right now. I, we need, we're losing our children to the streets. We have so much stuff, gang, gang violence, gun violence, police violence. We don't have, we're at a point in life right now, competition for me is like, I don't need it. Mm -hmm. Let's work together here. Mm -hmm. I don't need to compete with you. Right. Because guess what? We're both getting hit from all kinds all of sides. ways. So let's just come together and let's see what we can do to make things better. Yes. So I'm like, if you're looking to compete with me, you got it. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to compete with you. Mm -hmm. It takes two for a competition. I'm not going to compete with you. But if you want to say, let's get together and let's see what we can do. Yes. I'm down with that. Because we are running out of time to where we can say, listen, the community is almost gone. Mm -hmm. Some people say it's gone already, but I refuse to give that up. Mm -hmm. If I got to hold on by a string, you know, you know we got to fight. We gotta fight. We gotta fight because there's one little person in that community who wants to go to school and learn. Yes. There's one little person who wants to say, "I want to play, just play outside, not have to worry about um, a, a, a drive-by." Mm -hmm. There's if there's one little person in that community, then it's worth fighting for. Mm -hmm. You know, I said about Dr. King. You know, he fought for us. Mm -hmm. He fought for us. Malcolm fought for us. Mm -hmm. Garvey fought for us. You know, Mega Evans fought for us. They didn't know who we were. They didn't know who we were mm -hmm. by individuality, but they knew that we were there. Yes. And they kept on fighting. So we have to fight. I refuse to say it's a loss. It's not a lost cause. Mm -hmm. That's the first way of being defeated is when you believe it's a lost cause. Well, you know, as I'm listening to you and I'm hearing, as Herman would say, your passion mm -hmm. and your clarity of message and direction, mm -hmm. I'm going to challenge you on one word. Okay. And that word is fight. Mm -hmm. Do we have to fight or do we need to do something else? I think first we have to define, get our own definition for the word. Okay. What the word fight stands for to you. And what, so what, how would you define it for, for me, yourself? When I say fight, it means put my best foot forward and look to make things better. Okay. That's what fight means to me. Because mm -hmm. if I have to stand up for a fight, I will stand up to make things better. Right. Okay, because during the 60s, a lot of us went to the streets. A lot of us marched. Mm -hmm. But a lot of us didn't know what we were marching for. We just sort of cried when we followed the crowd. Mm -hmm. Where y'all going? <laughs> Where y'all going? <laughs> <laughs> right? And I remember, I, you know, I remember people, in, when I worked with her in Sharpton, I remember people saying, yeah, people come out to march, but what are they marching for? That always, that always hit me. Stuck in you. Yeah, what are we marching for? Because mm -hmm. after the march is over, what are you going to do? Right. What are you going to do? So we had to have an agenda, take the word and in the spirit of Kuchi Chakalia. Yes. Self-determination. Mm -hmm. you know, name and do for yourself mm -hmm. instead of having someone name and do it for you. That's yes. what Kuchi Chakalia is about. That's the second principle of Kwanzaa. So what you're saying is take the energy, mm -hmm. direct the energy appropriately, and move consistently in that space. 
Yes, that's what a lifetime commitment to. Excellent. Suits. All right. Thoughts, comments? No, I concur. I mean, fight for me means don't give up. Mm -hmm. You know, my mom always says, you can be tired, mm -hmm. <laughs> you, you, you can be mad, but don't give up. Mm -hmm. You can't stop. That's right. You know, mm -hmm. you, 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 can, you can clock out for a minute, mm -hmm. but you best come back. Don't give up. So yes. for me, it's the same thing. Just, you got to keep going. Keep putting your... And it's hard. This is not. This work is not. This is. It's, it's not easy work. I'm not. What I'm gonna say is that it's not fun. Mm -hmm. I enjoy it. Yes. But it's not fun. Mm -hmm. This is not a day at the park. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yes. But I enjoy what I do. Gotcha. So just don't give up. So I'm. I'm with. I'm with my brother Herm over there. Yeah. Like Brother Herman has said, you know, you know, back in the '60s, and we look at what Dr. King is doing. But at the end of the day, you know what? Sammy Davis Jr. came out and sang, Halle Berry Fonda came out and sang. Mm -hmm. They still enjoyed themselves. They made sure that we had a balance of my aunt. Yes. Mm -hmm. We were fighting. We, were good. we know where we're going, but you know what? We still had time to enjoy each other. Yes. We still had time to have a cookout. Mm -hmm. See, Dr. King. But Dr. King still went to Jamaica and relaxed mm -hmm. and wrote his books, right? We, so, for those who think it's all about this, no. It's a balance. There's a my aunt in there. Mm -hmm. You have to look at that my aunt. Yes. So let's. We need all hands on deck. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We need our rappers to write positive words. Mm -hmm. yes. We need our musicians to give us that beat to, yes. to march to. Mm -hmm. but, you know, we need another, where's our dizzy? Mm -hmm. Where's the dizzy from? So we need that beat. We need the songs. So we, we march. Uh -uh. We gotta get that beat in there. Uh -huh. So when the hair is coming, they yes. will hear us before they see us. Mm -hmm. yes. And they say, oh, we know what that's for. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we have all the pieces of the puzzle. It's Who's putting the puzzle together and why they're putting the right. puzzle together? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. once again, Kuchi Chakulia, mm -hmm. self-determination. Mm -hmm. So I'm just sitting up here thinking, of course, you know, I have songs and beats going through my <laughs> head. Y'all know I do. I know you do. <laughs> I know you do. <laughs> Get me started. No, let me let me hear what you got. So <laughs> But I think I think it is important that people hear what the both of you are saying. And I think it's also important that that redefinition mm -hmm. of fight gets put out there mm -hmm. because when people hear that word fight, they automatically think violence, the fists go up. <clears throat> and they're thinking about hurting someone mm -hmm. and someone being, there's a winner and there's a loser. Mm -hmm. But in this situation, you two are talking about everyone being a winner in a healthy and positive way. Mm -hmm. You know, back in the, um, the 80s, you know, Bruce Lee and, and Enter the Dragon said, mm -hmm. the art of fighting without fighting. Mm. Okay? And you know, we, we, when the martial arts, when we do it with uh, young people, we say, the last thing you do is a physical confrontation. Because once you cross over that line, you can't come back. Right. So I'm going to teach you how to talk yourself out of a confrontation. Mm -hmm. I'm going to teach you how to say, my brother, I love you. So that way it brings the energy back down. Mm -hmm. But you see, two male alphas get up there. Mm -hmm. No one wants to back down. But say, yo, man, I love you, bro. Thank you. What are you going to do for that? So the art of fighting without fighting. Okay. And that's very important. Okay. So when you talk about that spirit of Mayotte also, I just want to point out, that's partly why we organized the event on October 18th the way that we did, so that we would have the education piece about the raising the awareness in the community, in the churches, mm -hmm. but also have that healing piece mm -hmm. and have that entertainment piece with the spoken word artists, with the singers, with the skit that mm -hmm. will take place that day, because it is important that we cover the holistic picture of the event mm -hmm. and of this particular social play mm -hmm. as you mentioned. Yeah. So gentlemen, just in closing, mm -hmm. what are some final words that you would like to give to our audience? Go ahead, Brother Herman. Put it on me. <laughs> Put it on me. Um, there's so many words. You know, and it, it's just trying to sum it up and not, not, not take a whole lot of time, but um, be the change that you want to see. Mm -hmm. and more importantly, I think that that um, that goes to the point you were saying, being responsible, what's going on in your home, mm -hmm. being responsible, what's going on in your home. 
being responsible and going to your home, being peace and be peace, peace, and it'll all equal up to the exact same thing. Yes. You know, so be the change that you want to see okay? and believe that you can be that change. I know that's right. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's a good gun to you. That is. Yeah. I mean, for me, it's just the word journey. A lifetime commitment. It's a commitment to mm -hmm. your lifetime. Mm -hmm. Commitment to excellence. That's right. That's right. Because it grows and changes yes. as you grow and change. Yes, it just showed up. That's right. I don't know about that. <laughs> and so, in closing here on Dr. Walls and Friends, I will leave you with the motto that I leave everyone with. Mm -hmm. And that is always remember to live your greatest life. We will see you again real soon on Dr. Walls and Friends. Ruby Burke of Children's Book Workshop is Vice President and Executive Director of Operations of Sisters in Harmony. Ruby is an international author, mentor, and speaker. As a survivor of domestic violence, Ruby actively speaks about this topic both nationally and internationally. Ruby is the author of Survivor's Emancipation Day and Yap Yap the Talking Horse. Ruby also works with youth to build their self-esteem, combat the effects of bullying, and understand the importance of developing their goals and realizing their dreams. For speaking engagements, mentoring workshops, or book signings, call Ruby Burke, 301-523-9498, www.rubyburke.com here with the president and founder of Sisters in Harmony, Brother Ed Umoja Herman. So I've had two Hermans today on Dr. Walls and Friends. Play the lottery. Play the lottery. I better play the lottery. <laughs> All right. And I wanted to bring you on for two reasons. One, because this is your creation. She is me, Sisters in Harmony. She is me. This is your creation. And I wanted you to share with the audience, one, what led you to this creation, and two, where they can find it should they desire one of their own. Well, Dr. Walsh, thank you for having me on. Um, in fact, 50% of the women in this picture are from Philadelphia. Really? Yes. This was my very first project I did in Philly way back when, when I came to Philly. And um, she's me. The storyline behind this is that we see a lot of women of color looking at each other like we're enemies. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, but no, you guys are sisters. So when I put the piece together, I call it She Is Me because there's three aspects in this image that makes it that happen. One, you, the looker, yes. is looking and saying that she is me. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now the women are looking at you and saying she is me. Oh, look at that. And then the last part of the aspect with people, I mean, we don't really talk about, I don't talk about a lot, but you have planet Earth. Yes. Looking at the women and looking at you and saying, mm. she is me. Oh. So you have three aspects of she is me in the project. That's what I did. So when you look, when you put this up on your wall, you're looking at it, it's looking at you, and Mother Earth is looking at you. Wow. And you say, she is me. Wow. And that's the whole, the whole concept behind this. And I had the women give me different poses. As you see, some of them, like she's holding a baby. You see yes. the color, you see them reach out. And this is actually a mother and three daughters right here. Oh, that's beautiful. And it's right here from Philly. So, and then, you know, like I said, the majority of the women are often feeling this. When you look at it, I want the women to see themselves. Yes. And say, she's me. Yes. Because, you know, women have, there's only two life givers that we know of. Mm -hmm. Two life givers. All right. Women and Mother Earth. Yes. That's it. And so she is me. And it's interesting because as you said that, when you brought Mother Earth, into it and I'm looking at the moons and I'm thinking about the moon energy and the female energy mm -hmm. all I kept thinking about was birth and the fact that you know mother earth births everything that we need mm -hmm. and that women birth what we need as well yeah. so you know if you if you take women out of the equation we sister exists in, mm -hmm. in a hundred years, there'd be no one left mm -hmm. because there's no women to birth the nation. Right. What would we have? So she is me is actually playing homage to women and have, letting the women enjoy themselves, love themselves, respect themselves to what it says. She is me. Yes. And I tried, what, what I did when we did, we have young, old, plus size, thin, different women, locks, straight hair. So that way, I try my no best hair. to, to <laughs> no hair. Mm -hmm. We try to make sure we show different as, as many aspects of the women as we possibly can yes. in this project. So that's what's and what I love about you, you've done other poster series as well. 
and you use the everyday woman yeah. and you know sometimes people will say well, you need a celebrity in there in order for a picture to sell and you say no I'm going to use the everyday woman because they are a celebrity to someone yeah I mean and that goes back to what I say now when we say um, we are spiritual beings having a human experience mm -hmm. now that your human experience limits your spiritual greatness yes now we all have spiritual greatness within us. Mm -hmm. So why do we need a celebrity to tell us how great we are? Right. So we, when we look within ourselves, we should see the spirit of what God created, what some of us say Allah, some of us say Unturk. We see what created us to be who we are, as right. great as we are. So it's okay to have a, a, a celebrity, mm -hmm. but before that person was a celebrity, it was still a human being. That's right. So my whole thing is just taking everyday women. So the woman who's walking down the street, mm -hmm. when they see that they feel comfortable, they see themselves. They, yes. they see something of themselves yes. in this. I don't want them to get lost. Oh, you have a movie star up there. That's mm -hmm. focus. No, don't focus on the everyday women. That's right. Because those movie stars are movie stars because those everyday women support them. That's right. So it comes down, it comes down again to the everyday women and respecting who they are. So it's she me. And also one of the things that you mentioned is always young girls who are looking at these yeah. women and see themselves they see something about them that attracts them and I know for me my eye goes to the center but it goes to this woman specifically because she has locks and I think about myself and I just recently cut my hair that was that long <laughs> you know but I still look at her and automatically I go my eyes go to her and I connect with her yeah. And that's, that's important to me. I always tell, I, always, I say on the radio all the time, that this is not about you as an individual. Mm -hmm. God never gives a blessing to one person. Mm -hmm. That blessing is for you and to help other people. So that blessing is for many more. It comes through you, but it's for many more. Okay. So when we look at this image, I want people to remember that somewhere in the world, there's a little girl somewhere who's been told she's not beautiful, she can't do this, she can't do that. And she looks at this image, and your image is going to inspire her to say, yes, I can do it. Because right. look at her, and that's somebody just like me. She's that's not right. a movie star, she's not a, but this person, and look at this person, she's so beautiful. So this, when these young girls look at that, they see something mm -hmm. positive. Because it's not about this individual. We're all here, we're all put here, I believe, to inspire the next generation. Mm -hmm. Dr. King inspired us. Marcus Garvey inspires. We're living on the inspiration of Allah who came before us. Yes. What are we going to leave for those who come after us? Yes. That's very important. It's called legacy. Mm -hmm. It's continuing the legacy. We sometimes say Sankofa. Mm -hmm. What is Sankofa? We look at the principle of Sankofa. If we start to practice and those practice after us, what are we going to do? All right. We have to make sure that happens. It is up to us. Dr. King knew he was not going to see the fruits of his labor, mm -hmm. but he believed someone down the road was going to see. So what are we, what, what are we planting mm -hmm. so someone will have fruits from our labor mm. in the years to come? That's a so question. that she is me. Yes. Yeah. Well, while I have you on the couch, I'm going to keep you on the couch. We're <laughs> going to take a quick commercial break and come right back because as Herman Davis mentioned, Sisters in Harmony is a part of this event coming up on October 18th and why this is important to you. So we'll be back shortly on Dr. Walls and Friends. The Greatest Soul Journey by Dr. Kathleen E. Walls is a workbook style journal designed to assist you in taking an honest look at your life. This journal will provide you with clarity and help you assess your life, your relationships, your thoughts and beliefs, and the ways in which you are working toward your greatest life. For copies of The Greatest Soul Journey, go to AskDrWalls.com. That's A-S-K-D-R-W-A-L-L-S dot com. And remember, live your greatest life. Thank you all for coming today. We are so excited to be here to be able to promote peace and love, to promote harmony, yeah. and to promote support. And I'll give you a little, a little pun on all of those. As you know, Herman Davis from the Peace and Love Foundation, so always pushing peace and love, right? That's right. And then this is Ed Herman of Sisters in Harmony. He's the president of Sisters in Harmony. I will have each of them talk about who they are and what they do. And I am Dr. Kathleen Walls of Dr. Walls and Friends. 
I tell people all the time, my name is Wall, so I'm always around you, and I'm always here to support you. <laughs> so we have support, we have peace and love, and we have harmony. <laughs> I like that. All right. And we just want to take a few moments and tell you how we came together and why we came together today. I think it's fascinating that here are two men who have been impacted by domestic violence and who are so passionate about increasing the awareness as well as increasing the healing within the global community because we know this is not something that just happens here in Philadelphia, but this is something that happens worldwide. So I'm honored that they have both turned to me to assist them in the promotion of peace, love, harmony, and healing. And so at this juncture, I am going to pass the mic over to Herman Davis of the Peace and Love Foundation. <laughs> no, but, uh, this, I actually met Dr. Walls and Ed Herman last year, very last minute. They were doing a panel discussion on domestic violence at North by Northwest, correct? 7165 Germantown Avenue. Mm -hmm. It was last minute, and I said I would love to assemble a panel, I would love to do this, and it was an amazing um, session. And then early this year, I said, Joe, we're going to do it again. And I said, how about we do a four part series? Because there's a lot of issues, but I, as I, I'm in different schools, different communities, I feel like this city is in, um, city need, is in need of some healing. A lot of generational anger. Um, a lot of our youth are just, they're just mad. Um, I, don't, I don't believe that our kids are bad. I think that they're mad, they're angry, they're confused, and they're misunderstood. Um, so sitting down with Dr. Walls, I said, let's address the healing process of, of this issue. Um, so we have some very interesting, very interesting um, panel, um, panelists. Um, and I hope that this message can get um, conveyed. Dr. Walls, and I would like to uh, congratulate her on her uh, TV, her show. She's going to be doing a... Um, <laughs> You're going to be doing a uh, cable show um, and possibly a mainstream show. And um, I think that would be the best way that we get this word out there. Um, but, um, you know, it has to stop. As we shared this month with uh, breast cancer, breast cancer is a serious disease. Um, but this also is a serious disease that um, it, it, it's time to do something different. Um, because it's, it's not getting any lighter, you know. Um, and that's it. And Herman? Thank you, Davis. First, I'd like to everyone, thank you for coming out. Um, what is, in my tradition as a committed elder, I, I greet you in the name of God, the ancestors, which puts the time most humbly war. Um, as the president and the founder of Sisters in Harmony, the, the foundation, what we put together is the put more positive images back into the community on a mental, physical, and spiritual level. And we took those three and then we made a five division organization where we do with health, we do the films, the music, um, creative art division, and the book division. And the reason we did that, my co-founder lives in Maryland, um, was to see what can we do as a people to put more positive things back in the community. Because someone said, our oh, kids are not bad, they're not bad. But they have all this energy inside of them. If you don't take energy and put some positive behind it, the negative is going to take over automatically. Because either you do this or you do that. So in Sisters in Harmony, we look to what can we give our youth, our community, and start connecting the dots across the global community. So we have followers and members right now in 24 countries. And we challenge the community, what can we do positive? I respect religion religious titles, but as we know, the title does not make you a good person. It's what you do with your hands. So after you tell me your titles and everything, show me what you're doing with your hands. I'm not, show me. I want to see what are you doing with your hands to make the community better. I'm, I, I respect political um, affiliations and parties, but that doesn't make you a good or bad person. Mm -hmm. So as president of the organization, I challenge the community to bring some positive to our table and let's see what can we do. So you know, now we have a radio show and now we're going to the cable, we have the cable network launching at the end of December, channel launching at the end of December, because we want to connect people doing positive things. 
And like Dr. Wall said, I always mess it up. She says, it's not that bad is doing such a good job. It's that good hasn't started doing a great job yet. Hmm. Okay, when good start doing a great job, we will take care of our community. You see, the reason we have challenges in our community is because we haven't stepped up as a family. What we, I tell people, I need everyone to be Dr. King or Malcolm in their household. Let's not worry about the street. You see, if I do it in my household and you do it in your household, that means if a household is all doing Dr. King, all doing Malcolm, right? And if the household is doing it, then the, the block is doing it, then the community is doing it, then we recapture our community. It's okay if you don't go out on the street and do it, but let's, let's talk about home first. Let's, the, let's take care of the home front. If everyone does it in their home, if everyone does Dr. King or Malcolm in their home, guess what? The home is good. The house is good. The block is good. Because I remember growing up when we had, you walked down the block and said, good morning, Miss So-and-so, good morning, Mr. So-and-so. Everyone knew everybody. See, the challenge we have as an organization now is just what he does is cool. What I do is cool, but guess what? He knows me and I know him. We start connecting with us because the, because the global community, we take our community back. And we tell the politicians what we want because we pay the salary. Okay, they are elected in, we should be able to remember we could let them out and we have, to remind, we have to remind them of that all the time. So what we can sisters and homies, stop putting, a, stop putting a light on what we're doing. So this is very important what we're doing here because domestic violence touches everybody. No matter how perfect your home is, if your child goes to school, with someone who at their house have issues, then that child comes into the classroom and acts out in the classroom because the teacher has to stop and take care of that or that child acts out on your child. Then you wonder why that child, then you have to go to school, take time from your job, go to school about why your child's been touched by somebody else's child. So domestic violence touches everybody. So this is very important. Very good. So as we start to open the show, Dr. Walls and Friends, and this, ad, this is being taped as you can see, and it is going to be aired on YouTube, and it is also going to be aired after November 5th on HerTube TV, HerTube.TV, and as Herman was telling us, Dr. Walls and Friends is now going to be going even into more households, so we're excited because this information, this healing that's going to happen today will touch many people's lives. You'll be able to find it on the internet. You'll also be able to find it on Roku. And currently, HerTube TV has a platform of over 10.1 million people. So we're looking to touch a lot of people's lives in a lot of countries. Domestic violence is something that, as I said, it impacts, it's worldwide. And what happens is a lot of times it doesn't have a name in certain cultures because it's become so commonplace that it's expected and they don't know that it's not okay. And so this is an opportunity to increase awareness, raise awareness, as well as increase solutions and provide solutions. And so I'm going to ask these two gentlemen one more question before I let them go and we bring our panelists up journey as well as some other products and then we have Miss Ann Brown from Enon and we have Miss Sonia with some jewelry over there and then we have the Herbalife team in the back and <laughs> we have about some health and some fitness and of course we have peace and love so give us a break we're gonna come back in a few moments yes oh and how could I forget thank you very much and the henna lady over here to my left so be sure to support our vendors and give us a moment and we're going to take a quick break and we'll be back on Dr. Walls and Friends. Stand together and drink from the unity cup. 
Kikombe cha umoja Harambe and friends. We are here today with a great panel of people who are going to help in this difficult conversation about domestic violence. This is Domestic Violence Awareness Month and there are so many aspects to it because many times people I think think it just involves the individual and the person who's doing the abusing and the person who's being the recipient of the abuse. But the reality is domestic violence impacts all of us. It is a community-wide problem, and when we talk about community, we're talking about the global community. Because somebody knows somebody, a child is being taught by a teacher, or a teacher is teaching a child who's witnessed, there's just, the impact goes on. There's a poem that my mother used to love. It was basically drop a pebble in the water, and you watch how the ripples go. And the reality is, once you drop a pebble in the water and it hits the bottom of that water, that body of water, that landscape is forever changed. And so this is what we're talking about when we talk about domestic violence, whether it's one incident or multiple incidents. It is something that has impacted us. It's something that's been imprinted upon us. And I mean, I remember being little and neighbors. I remember working and being confused at first. Why did Miss So-and-so always come in with sunglasses on? And then finally somebody kind of had to pull my coattail to the side and explain to me what was going on. And, you know, and so we're all, we are all impacted by this. At this time, I would like our panelists to introduce themselves and tell us who they are affiliated with. And then we're going to come back around and find out what brought you here today? Why is today important for you? Absolutely. My name is Anthony Miller, and uh, I serve as the Philadelphia manager for Be Me uh, Networks Incorporated. Um, but I'm not here in that capacity this afternoon. I'm here as a minister. I serve as an assistant pastor here in the city at New Life Beulah Baptist Church in South Philly. So I'll be giving comments uh, from that space. Good afternoon, my name is Anthony Jones. Good afternoon, my name is Mary May. I am CEO of Butterfly Love Consultations. I provide um, workshops, training, and relationship counseling for individuals who experience healing and trauma. Uh, good afternoon, peace be unto you. I am Kenneth Nordine. I am the Imam of the Philadelphia Messiah Claire Muhammad School. I'm also a part of the University of Pennsylvania Religious Community Council. But I'm here more today as the commander, post number six for the Muslim American Veterans Association. I want to connect that with the theme. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. So now my next question to you all is, what brings you here today? Why is today important for you? What is it about this panel that you said, yes, I need to be here and I need to be speaking about this topic? Well, as you said earlier, uh, domestic violence is a global issue. Um, and it resonates with many of us locally, if not in our homes, and surely with people we're connected to every day. And I, I arrived at this space because I've been much displeased by the institutional silence around this issue in our communities. We know, we know how prevalent domestic violence is, but for the most part, our churches have been relatively silent. Our schools and other religious institutions, faith-based institutions have been silent about the matter. Um, and silence, in my point of view, is, is to agree. If you don't speak up, then you are passively allowing such heinous activity to happen without, without raising your voice. And I, I, come, I come for that reason. Uh, as a person who is a product of an institution, of the institution, and a representative of the institution, I wanted to make it a point to be here to speak on, with regard to how the church uh, views domestic violence and, will, and offer some sensible solutions with regard to how we can move forward with the conversation and ensure that it doesn't happen anymore in our spaces. Yes. Well, I'm here today because uh, I'm actually currently on probation for domestic violence. And 
currently just ready to just you know speak upon you know all the issues and everything that I was actually going through. Uh, first and foremost, that I look at that the situation that I've been through with you know my ex-wife, my family, and everything else. That the people that was hurting was my children. So I'm actually here to try to you know make a change, a betterment as for myself, and you know try to conquer my demons and my anger within myself. So. So what brings us here? What brings me here is I believe in healthy relationships, and actually peeling back the layers of the onion regarding what that looks like. As my company is called Butterfly Love, we transform in different ways from the different experiences that we receive and impact and engage with. So because of that, um, we don't recognize how we communicate conflict or how we communicate change or how we communicate challenges or how we receive changes in our life either with health, mental health, financial changes in your job and how you actually interact with another person that creates an unhealthy relationship that sometimes becomes physical. And it's not necessarily that physical is the most difficult way of domestic violence, but it's also the emotional because words hurt more than sometimes the physical um, enactment and touch of a person. So my goal is to touch as many individuals as possible to help them understand the underlying reasons that cause them to respond and react in a way and to help them build their emotional traps to change the messages that they send by developing better coping skills and interacting with others. Well, as I said, I'm a uh, member of a veterans organization, which is uh, law enforcement on a political level. And um, I just want us to understand that many of those who have that background and experience are some of the most prone to domestic violence. But if you look at police force, you look at uh, veterans. And so I think what we have to reconcile ourselves with is that we live in a culture of not just violence, but violations. You see, violations produce violence. Uh, whether we vi uh, violate someone's integrity, their personal space, etc. cetera. Uh, so if we have that as part of our environment, that's a chronic condition, the violations. But then the violence becomes an acute problem. So we have to address the acute problem, but if we don't deal with the chronic condition, then we'll just have one acute problem after another as we are seeing manifest uh, in the whole media circus when it comes to all of these domestic violence incidents that are now proliferate. Yes. Uh, and you know, a lot of them are those who are least capable or qualified in dealing with all the violations. They just snap. But others, they have a, 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 a method, a, a, we'll just say a coping mechanism, but they have enough invested where they can just ease on by the moment. But the one who has very little, then he snaps at the least amount of pressure. So hopefully we can just look at um, Yes, domestic violence as a, an acute problem, but there's a chronic condition that exists, a culture of violations that really uh, are going to almost be like an assembly line. Yes. Mary, you know you can hold that because you know you have a thought off of that. Go ahead. <laughs> well, the thought that I had about the violations is that the violations is the mirror from within. And the mirror from within is unresolved loss or grief and different issues that, are, that we just basically haven't confronted. And because we don't confront them, we move from one situation to the next. And until we take a look into that suitcase that we haven't unpacked, we end react the trigger to, to violence. And it comes in different ways, again, verbally, physically.
course, we all know comprehensively comes from a place of pain. But I'm interested in the often religious justifications we use for being domestically violent. Now that's um, interesting because I don't know if I've ever thought about the religious implications. Right, yes, and so that's that's the most interesting and intriguing point to me, and that's where my opinion is most valuable in space. Yes. Um, where some literally use religion to justify um, why they take the upper hand in the household, or religion reinforces these themes as the man being the head of the household, or, you know, in all of our major world religions, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, the man plays the major role in the household. He is the protector, right? This is a language we use, whereby the man is always seen, a uh, scene somehow is above the woman. Um, and we've reinforced and perpetuated these themes throughout, throughout history. Um, I, I'm often cautious to say that men are the protectors of the household. Right, I would say that we are protectors of each other, that you, you protect portions of me that are exposed that I can't get to, and there are portions of your, you that I have to protect. But when, whenever we get into a conversation that pits men greater than women on any scale, then we run the risk for creating greater problems down the line that are just not emotional, uh, emotionally driven, but also would end up uh, being uh, physically harmful as well to these women. Very interesting. And, you know, as you were talking, I remember one time someone saying that in reference to the woman came from man's rib, was that the rib protects the heart. Right. And so, whereas the man may protect the woman physically, the woman is designed to protect the man emotionally. Absolutely. And I always thought that was an interesting way to look at it. Another thing, uh, Anthony, that you mentioned, and an elder actually taught me this, and I want everybody to try it at the moment. Point right now. Just point your finger out. So you have a finger pointing at somebody else to blame them. How many fingers are pointing back at you? That's right. You have three. That's right. So you need to look, right, exactly. <laughs> I see people going like this. Oh, I didn't notice those. <laughs> And that's the reality that we do. We have to hold the mirror up to ourselves. We have to look at ourselves more a lot of times than we look at the other person to see how are we responsible? What part are we playing in this? And so as I say that, I see some heads nodding on the panel and I'm feeling some energy that people have comments that they'd like to make. Who'd like to jump on the mic first? I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I'm glad the Reverend pointed out uh, a lot of the underpinning for, uh, we could say, violations that exist. And it has come from misunderstanding of religion. You see, I think a lot of it is not where we came from, but where we are going. Right. And so if we um, have come through, we just say, the evolution of society, there was a time when there was a need for men to do the heavy lifting. And so that uh, precipitated men being bigger and stronger physically. But we don't have the same need today. True. And so that means that we now have to redefine relationships. Yes. Right? And uh, I, I think the religion hasn't taken the time to redefine relationships and bring us to the point where we see the emphasis is not on what is on the outside. Mm -hmm. right? But the emphasis is what is on the inside. And inside, women actually have more strength spiritually than men. I mean, you know, I'll just give you one um, uh, saying of the Prophet Muhammad, the Prophet of the Islam. He said that Almighty God has a hundred components to his mercy and his compassion and his consideration. He kept 99 for himself. Mm and he put one part into the physical world. Mm -hmm. And that part is in the womb of a woman. Wow. Because that is the thing that nurtures you before birth, as well as after birth. Mm -hmm. uh, so the uh, realization that men have to come to, as our brother here said, all of us come from a woman. Mm -hmm. and we were all helpless 
in the arms of a woman, mm -hmm. and we were all dependent on the woman. The man didn't even have to be around after he donated his sperm, but many men right. <laughs> feel that they That's can do right. anything. Right. But the woman has to carry the life for nine months, yes. and then has to wean it for maybe up to two years, mm -hmm. and then has to wipe it and do all the other things that she is, uh, she has more of a makeup to do because uh, the nature in her is to be able to nurture. And so that is uh, the basic relationship that men should have for women, uh, not someone that's weaker than me physically, mm -hmm. unless he has to go out and chop down trees. Mm -hmm. But if he's not doing that for a living, <laughs> then he should not see himself as someone whose physical ability means that much. That's right. Yes. Because she yes. can achieve just as much as she can Socially, but both of us just use our fingers for texting and stuff like that. <laughs> right. <laughs> but he has to look at her real strength, and yeah. her real strength is to be able to nurture the life, right? To carry the life, to nurture it, so that uh, it can form itself, and really it can form an attachment right. to uh, where it came from. And that first attachment is seen in the mother, and her tenderness. A concern, a consideration has to be something that is valued by men. And men don't value it. Or if they are disconnected from it, then they can never value a woman as a mate. Right. They can never value really a, a woman as one who has um, great strengths when it comes to emotions, when it comes to mentality, when it comes to spirituality. And to some extent, uh, she is above the man. Uh, so just as the man, in some extent, is above the woman physically. Then, mm -hmm. to some extent, she's above him spiritually. And then the question has to be asked, which element is more valuable today? Wow. <laughs> and the element that's more valuable, that we can learn more from them when it comes wow. to spirituality than they can learn from us wow. when it comes to physicality. Because see, no matter how prolific a man is, mm -hmm. He will never be stronger than a gorilla. Now he will never be more prolific <laughs> sexually than some of the other creatures. He won't be the one as fast as a cheetah. So right. when it comes to his physicality, you can find an animal right. to be better than him. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to the real human identity, and the real human identity is identified as compassion and concern for life. Uh, and that's what sets human beings above animals. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, we can go back and do some redefinition, but then we have to look at um, how the culture in the home, uh, really, they say the average child witnessed 4,000 murders a month on TV and you know, just things like that. So we really have to uh, look at and see how we can begin to uh, examine our home life. And I'm glad that you say that because part of it, Mary, I want you to hold on mm -hmm. to that. I'm sure you do. Oh, that. <laughs> <laughs> when I, you know, you said a lot there. Yes. A lot. And I'm glad that you did because part of what we're talking about is social context. Part of what we're talking about is redefining roles within relationships. And another piece that I heard was empathy understanding and appreciation and so understanding who, what your role is now in today's context as a man as a woman as a mother as a father and so forth and also then looking at really understanding and appreciating what you bring into a relationship so let's marinate on that a little bit we're going to take a quick commercial break and when we come back, Mary, you can pick up on that as well as share your thoughts. We'll be back in a moment on Dr. Balls and Friends. Ruby Burke of Children's Book Workshop is Vice President and Executive Director of Operations of Sisters in Harmony. Ruby is an international author, mentor, and speaker. As a survivor of domestic violence, Ruby actively speaks about this topic both nationally and internationally. 
Ruby is the author of Survivor's Emancipation Day and Yap Yap the Talking Horse. Ruby also works with youth to build their self-esteem, combat the effects of bullying, and understand the importance of developing their goals and realizing their dreams. For speaking engagements, mentoring workshops, or book signings, call Ruby Burke, 301-523-9498, www.rubyburke.com. Welcome back to Dr. Walls and Friends. And as you can see, our couch got a little bit longer in between that commercial break. So we are going to have Mary come back and answer that question. But before she does that, we're going to introduce our new panelists. And so we have Ebony and Tim. And I'm going to pass the mic down. The question that the others have answered is, why are you choosing to be on this panel today? Why is this topic important to you? Okay. This topic is important to me because um, being in a marriage where domestic violence was prevalent, um, I dealt with a lot of things that I felt as though I might have been alone in the world, like no one else may have understood what I was going through. I kept a lot of things to myself, and um, it took a toll on the marriage. Um, so I feel like being here today to be able to tell my story may entice other people to realize that they're not alone, that there's help out there, there's people who are going through or have gone through the same thing, and there are ways to either get out or get help, and you don't have to feel like you're alone. Um, I think it's important to me because... And we need you to speak up sorry. a little. Being on the other side, um, you have to realize that you have a problem. You know, sometimes it's hard as men, sometimes it's hard to realize that you have a problem. So, you know, um, we're we too caught up in ourselves, or in our jobs, or our personal, you know, our, our personal things that we go through. And, and you know, um, we, have to, we have to get help. We have to realize that we have a problem and get help. And I think it's, it's very important to me because, um, like my wife said, we, we've gone through a lot. You know, we've actually, we, We've gone through a marriage, divorce, and remarried. You know, but you know, I had to, on my end, I had to realize that I had a problem. And I do suffer from a little bit of other things. Um, I suffer from PTSD a little bit. And, and that was another big issue to our marriage. And again, I didn't realize that and I had to get help. So if I could um, teach people out there to, and, and to, to speak up, and to say, you know, I have a problem, I need to get help. It's okay to get help. And that's another another area where us men, we don't, um, we're not truthful with ourselves and say that we need to help. So I just want to you know, let the other guys out there know that it's okay to say right. that problem. Well, thank you, Ebony and Tim, for joining us. So we're going to pick up with the conversation, and uh, we'll just include you right on in the flow, okay? <laughs> so Mary, you know, I had asked you a question before commercial break just about with the changing roles and so forth in society and also the importance of understanding how our roles have changed in society but also appreciating what each person brings to the relationship. But in addition to that, being a marriage and family therapist, I know you have some other thoughts that you'd like to share. I want to do a courageous acknowledgement first before yes. we um, continue on the theme of the conversation. The courageous acknowledgement is that we oftentimes look at or believe that it's always the men who abuse. Mm -hmm. And there are some statistics and in, in situations where women are the predominant predators and abuse men as well for unresolved issues that have helped, helped them to not build healthy relationships. So I just wanted to acknowledge that women do abuse as well. Yeah. Um, but society, of course, always says it's all men and, and Predominantly, it may be a larger number. I don't really know the statistics offhand, mm -hmm. but it's they're running hand in hand with the way that life has shifted. The things that we are infused by, we, we experience trauma every single day. Every time you turn on the news, you're exposed to some type of traumatic event, and that goes into your energy. And until you're able to release that through exercise, through talking, through sharing an exchange with someone which would resemble a healthy relationship, you end up carrying that in your spirit and then 
lashing out at people. And it can affect your professional as well as your personal relationships. And I think that that's important to kind of just take a moment to pay attention to the fact that everyone can be an abuser, unfortunately. And everyone can be impacted by just looking at the news or looking at aggressive TV shows or playing aggressive video games or the music that we enjoy. Like if you put everything in perspective, you can also take it out of that perspective and it can have a negative connotation as well. So all of those things being thrown at us in different ways cause how we interact with other people. Yes. Before the break, we talked about violations. Yes. And we also talked about religious um, templates or beliefs and values that people have. Those are really strongholds that challenge us, that we're, we're constantly trying to be loyal to our upbringing or loyal to what it was that we were exposed to, be it religious and or the mirror within our home. And in the new age and in the new century, we should really look at shifting and making what's realistic to be healthy in our own home. And that can look different in each address as you have your values around food, your values around communication, your values around mental health, as well as emotional health. And having those courageous conversations to just be transparent and not having Q word, or having a Q word within your relationship or partnership on how we're gonna talk about this difficult thing and making it a, an appointment, if you will. Okay, well at dinner time we're going to engage in the game or we're gonna engage in talking about our finances for this week and we have $200 to spend this week on activities, gas and so forth and we're going to discuss how that's going to be played out. And I'm minimizing it by just saying it's $200 for the week, but that creates the opportunity of open conversation, realistic or what's within our boundaries that we can and can't do. And those the same way that you would mirror that in other difficult conversations. So if you do it in everyday conversations, when it comes to the conversations that are difficult that you have anger around or you have unresolved issues or every time this person walks past you on the left versus the right or every time your paper is balled up where the words are not written straight, you don't have to react and respond in a violent manner and those are just little violations that occur you know, every single day, even in traffic and so forth. So it's a matter of your perception and your perspective on how you put energy into realizing your role in a situation impacts and drives the energy to be a positive or negative. I'm glad that you said that. You know, as I was talking with someone earlier and I felt a rhyme getting ready to come on, you know, and in one of my other lives, I'm a pretend rapper. I don't let too many people know that. So, <laughs> a pretend rapper, you know. And so I kept hearing in my head a collective perspective a collective perspective. And it was what are we believing collectively? And so as you were talking about this idea of a society of violation, that's a collective perspective that we are okay with violence in the sense of the video games that are put out there, the music that is a part of our, and I'm gonna call it our diet because we're taking it into our body and it's not creating life. If we look at diet, it's spelled D-I-E-T. So these are things that are killing us as opposed to putting things into our limit, things that will enhance our life. And so the collective perspective, do we have a collective perspective of health, a collective perspective of healing? And that's what this is today. And so Mary used a phrase, you said courageous, you said you wanted to be courageous shift. No, it was courageous conversation. No, that wasn't it. It was courageous something else. Anybody remember what she said? Acknowledgement. 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 Yes. yes, I was about to say courageous kudos. But <laughs> <laughs> courageous acknowledgement. And to acknowledge each of you for coming on the panel and sharing your stories. Because very much so, Anthony and Timothy, to sit up here in front of a group of people who you don't know in a space that you don't know if it's safe yet or not, because y'all will know me, but y'all are going like, all right, lady, I'm going to trust you for a moment, right? <laughs> and, but to share that part of your story and for Ebony to come and share this part of the journey as well, I think we should give them a round of applause. Now, Dr. Wells and friends, and I 
has my new little logo over here, and y'all can see it on the table back there. On my show, I always have a tambourine. And whenever I hear something that excites me or something that I feel as though needs to be emphasized, it's like an exclamation point, I shake a tambourine. Of all days, I have what? Forgotten my tambourine. But I always got a backup because I keep a tambourine app on my phone. <laughs> All right, so there's no reason why we should ever be without a tambourine. So, and it works too. All right, now. You can also do your hands like this. Let me see everybody do their hands like this. And you can do both hands. I just got this thing in my hand. So we can do both hands. All right. And so, for that, I would like to give y'all a tambourine shake but for being here. And for sharing this part, because you're right, we all do, it's okay to ask for help. And many times we forget that it's okay to ask for help, or we assume that asking for help is a sign of weakness. Or that, and Ebony, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to gear this one to you, is that sometimes things start to happen to us that we know are not appropriate, but we start to feel embarrassed about it. Can you expand more on that? Let me pass the mic down. I've definitely had moments where I was more so embarrassed and shocked to say that this is not happening to me. Mm -hmm. um, which made me more so put it behind myself to say, y'all, it's not real. I'm not going to deal with it. And it's not okay to do that. It's not okay to feel that way, you know, because then you start, it, it starts turning into uh, words that were said, then it's physical, and then you're just starting to accept that this is my way of life, this is just how it's gonna be. Mm -hmm. But actually realizing, like I said before, that there's help out there, that there's people out there who have gone through this and reaching out, which is what I did, which is how I found the love and peace through uh, my fellow friend, Herman, you know, that help was, it, it made me realize that I'm not alone. And when I did reach out, the embarrassment went away and I realized that it was something serious that I needed to take care of. And not just for myself, but for my husband. You know, because when I, when I met him, he was not this person. So I knew it wasn't him. I knew he was sick. And, you know, trying to de-escalate situations, I knew that if I, if I tried my best, then maybe it would help him and maybe he would realize that it's, it's not you, I don't fault you, but we can't get through this. So definite feelings of embarrassment, not wanting to tell your family, not wanting to let your friends know this is what you're going through at home, but being scared to go home because you don't know when the bomb is going to go off. What trigger words not to say? And then having all this go through in front of your children and not knowing what to tell them because you don't come from this type of home. You don't come from this background. You don't have any experience in this situation and you don't know anyone who does to turn to. So it's it's hard. But also realizing that it's also hard as the doer when they don't acknowledge and helping them get help to help both of you. So. Tim, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Um, again. <clears throat> It was the opposite for me. You know, she was embarrassed about when she said my wife said she felt that, you know, she was alone. It took for me to be alone to realize that I had a problem. So, um, unfortunately when I was younger, I did grow up around domestic violence and a lot of people don't realize how much that plays a role because and, and I think uh, a big part that made me change, like she said, we have two kids. I have a little daughter, my daughter's five, and my son's seven. And I remember at my son's age, seeing what I saw. And I still remember vivid to this day. So I had to really pretty much think about, all right, he, he knows what I'm going through, and for a long time, I held resentment to my dad. And I didn't want him to, I didn't want, to, I didn't want him to go through the same thing. And I didn't want him to have that resentment against me because as guys, you know, our, our, our love and our heart is our, our sons, you know? So I didn't want um, him to go through that. And like I said, it took for me to be alone because
because once you're alone, you don't have anybody to turn to. So you gotta, you know, you gotta, you gotta do some soul searching and actually look in the mirror. And, That's and what find Anthony yourself. was saying. That's so. right. Hold that mirror up. Anthony, is there anything you would like to add to what they've shared? Yes, yeah, pretty much. Uh, to piggyback off of what you just said, like I got three daughters. First and foremost, I look at and as us being males, we should tear our women down. You know, like I'm trying to build my daughters to have, you know, higher self-esteem, morals, principles, and respect about themselves. How to carry themselves, how to conduct themselves, the mannerism, just you know, all of the above. Uh, like not too long ago, I just started a foundation. Whereas uh, we feed the homeless like twice a week. Mm -hmm. We're in process of uh, actually starting an urban garden. We got access to like three lots right now. So any positive thing that I do, I like you know my daughters and my son too. So that way, they, at least they see this is what a man is supposed to treat me like. Mm -hmm. So at least you know when they do experience certain things, they can go back and look at well. That's right. Daddy embraced and installed these certain values and principles into us. Mm -hmm. So you know, and, and, and the thing, key thing is though, that I never had that. Mm -hmm. Walked right past my father the same day he died. Mm -hmm. Died from shooting dope. Never used it for an excuse. I try to avoid that by dealing with different women mm -hmm. or certain things like that. You know, I was an inhabitant person of excuses. Mm -hmm. Nah, that's not being a man. You gotta look in the mirror at yourself. Look at it. You got sickness, buddy. You better handle that. You're an older now. You're not a boy no more. You're responsible for four other individuals. So you know one thing with me now, like I just I don't tolerate excuses. You know, I try to tell you know a lot of men, you know, to pick it back off of what you just said too, it goes both ways because a lot of women don't know how to treat men. So that goes both ways. So the thing is that I look at seek professional help. That's it. That's all. So that way, when that volcano about to erupt, you know what to do. My motto is, you know, I'm Muslim. What we do, you make the wudu. Wudu is ablution. It's like putting a, a water over fire. Go somewhere, meditate. The whole key thing is just finding out, you know, what's best for yourself. Self-preservation, get to know who you are. We're going to take a quick commercial break. When we come back, I'm going to share some statistics um, that were recently from the National Domestic Violence Hotline 2014 statistics. And then I'm going to come back and I'm going to ask two of the two gentlemen from the religious affiliations to talk a little bit more about how do you deal with domestic violence when it comes to your awareness within the religious institution. So we'll be back shortly on Dr. Walls and Friends. Welcome back to Dr. Walls and Friends, and yes, that is me in surround sound. So, <laughs> you know, technology is an amazing thing when we can work it out. All right, so we are back from commercial break, but I do definitely want to make some announcements. Remember to be sure to check out our vendors, and then coming up at 5 o'clock, we have a self-defense demonstration and some very hands-on, as well as, obviously, <laughs> so practical skills for people to use and learn, and that will be by Mike Andreas. He was just on my radio show the first Tuesday in October, and you can also go to the YouTube channel. We've done some videos before, but he's going to do a demonstration for us today and teach you just some very simple techniques. So please be sure to stick around for that. Um, also following this segment, one of our panelists has to go run and do some parent duties. So we are going to thank, let's take a moment and thank Anthony for being with us for the time that he shared. Let's give him a round of applause. And so the couch will shrink a little bit after that commercial break. All right. So welcome back to Dr. Walls and Friends. As I said, I'm going to share some statistics with you and some definitions with you because we've been talking about domestic violence. But sometimes we don't have a full scope of what that means. And it was very interesting because last year when we did a time to help, a time to heal, we had several people come up at the end of the event and say, oh my goodness, I didn't know I had been in a domestic violent relationship because it hadn't been 
physical violence. They hadn't recognized that there's the emotional abuse, that there is the mental abuse, there's financial abuse. And as I was researching for this panel, now there's even another category which is called reproduction abuse. And I said, I had never even thought about that before. But it was the idea that the person keeps wanting you either to get pregnant or keeps asking you to terminate pregnancies. And so it's the control over having children and you know having them in short succession right after each other. So nine months, 11 months, and so forth. And I said, wow. And so it all comes back though to the definition of abuse. And I'm going to read the definition that the National Domestic Violence Hotline provides. And you can go online and find them. And they say, abuse is a repetitive pattern of behaviors to maintain power and control over an intimate partner. These are behaviors that physically harm, arouse fear, prevent a partner from doing what they wish, or force them to behave in ways they do not want. Abuse includes the use of physical and sexual violence, threats and intimidation, emotional abuse, and economic deprivation. Many of these different forms of abuse can go on, be going on at the same time. And so it goes back to that power and control over somebody. When we look at some of the statistics that are spoken or that currently are listed, it says on average, 24 people per minute are victims of rape, physical violence, or stalking by an intimate partner in the United States. More than 12 million women and men over the course of a year. Nearly three in 10 women, 29%, and one in 10 men in the U.S. have experienced rape, physical violence, and or stalking by a partner and report a related impact on their functioning. Nearly 15% of women and 4% of men have been injured as a result of interpersonal violence that include rape, physical violence, and or stalking by an intimate partner in their lifetime. One in four women and one in seven men age 18 and older in the United States have been the victim of severe physical violence by an intimate partner in their lifetime and more than one in three women and more than one in four men in the United States, oh, excuse me, I read that one, nearly half of all women and men in the United States have experienced psychological aggression by an intimate partner in their lifetime. And females age 18 to 24 and 25 to 34 generally experience the highest rates of intimate partner violence. And as many of our panelists have mentioned already, those who were exposed to domestic violence when they were younger, forms of abuse when they were younger, tend to also be involved either in relationships of abuse when they're older, either being the victim and or being the abuser. So it is very important when Anthony talks about how he has really now changed the way in which you use your hands. You now talking about gardening, talking about feeding the homeless. There's such a peace and love that comes with you using your hands and now showing your children a different way. So before you get ready to exit, what are some final words that you'd like to share with the audience? Pretty much, God willing, that this actually will help touch many as possible as I can to let any male know that sit back, recollect back, think before you even touch a woman or acknowledge, look in the mirror. You sit, comb your hair, brush your hair, beard, whatever it is, try to beautify yourself, look at it. You have a mental sickness with yourself. So I look at the reality of it, try to seek professional help. That's all, just don't be egotistical, don't be proud about what you do. Real men don't have pride. We're not egotistical. We, you know, 
You have emotions just like everybody else. We're human. It's okay. Seek the professional help that's needed. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. We're going to take a quick commercial break. And when we come back, that chair will be just a little bit shorter. All right. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Dr. Walls and Friends. And, you know, one of the things, we're going to come back to the religious question that I asked before. But one of the hot topics that I keep hearing coming up, and it really goes with something that we deal with all the time, are the differences of how this is experienced by men and how this is experienced by women. And, you know, one of the things that Anthony mentioned and a couple other panelists mentioned as well was that we each play a role in this. And that abuse, as Mary pointed out, can be from the woman towards the man. It can be verbal. It can be mental. It can be emotional as well. And we also know that it occurs within the homosexual community as well. This is domestic violence is something that occurs throughout the various communities. I remember one time somebody saying, you know, I know how to push his buttons. And my response was, then you know what not to push. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, as I mention this, I see some of you shaking your head. And Ebony, I'm going to go to you first. And what is it as far as being, having been in a relationship, and you two said you married, you divorced, you got the help, you made the changes, and now you're remarried again. As you reflect back on yourself, as you hold that mirror up to yourself, what did you notice? Well, Dr. Walls, I noticed that I too had been an abuser. And even though he would tell me that, you know, after his physical bouts with me, that I was, phys I was mentally and emotionally abusing him as well, I wouldn't listen. Because I felt like, you know, well, words don't hurt as bad as physical, uh, physical bruises. But once he took the chance to get help, and I went to him on some of his sessions, I had to realize too that, like you said, we push, sometimes we can push their buttons. We know what to say just at that right moment in time to make them explode. You know, we may not be doing it on purpose all the time, but just to continue either arguing or to get our point across, and it's just as bad as physical abuse. There's times where, you know, women, we may not think so, but we may even be out in public and just demeaning to our, our, our husbands or our spouses. That's enough to make them feel either not loved, not wanted, and they're humans, they're people too. You know, they have, they may not show it, but they have a lot of emotion. They have a lot of feelings. And to have someone feel like that at, the, at my hand, it hurt me to know that somebody that I love, not intentionally, but out of anger and retaliation, I was doing these things. I was saying things that would hurt him. I was saying things that would, you know, strike a chord, get under his skin, make him feel less of a man because I was hurt. I felt like this was what I needed to do to show him how bad I was feeling. But in turn, it was only feeding fuel to the fire. And I had to step back after our separation and really look at things that I could have changed. In wanting to help him, I also needed to help myself. It's not gonna be a one-sided thing. And a lot of times, it's never a one-sided thing. We do put a lot of blame on the men, but you can't argue with yourself. A lot of times you can't, there, you, if you walk away from a situation, it will de-escalate. De Men and women, take time out, get your thoughts together, walk away from the situation, if possible. If not possible, you, you have to barricade yourself in a room so that you both can get a moment to each other to get your thoughts together, come back to reality in, in that sense, and try to start it all over again it's better than continuing to add that fuel to the fire. Because you are, in turn, you are an abuser just as well. And it's not right. And 
I think one of the things, and thank you for sharing that, and one of the things we have to understand that relationships, each relationship is different. So that may be the reality for some people's relationships. And then for other people's relationships, they may be being attacked and there isn't a trigger. The person, the person who's doing the attacking is responding to something outside of the people who are within that household. And so, you know, as people are going to get help, either individually as the person who's doing the abusing, the person who's being an abused, people who are in the relationship pattern of abuse. Mary, what are some ways, as a marriage and family therapist, what are some ways or some um, guidance that you can provide for people to seek the appropriate type of therapy that they need? Thank you, Dr. Walls. That is so instrumental in regards to picking or selecting the person that's gonna take you through this journey because you have to make sure that if it's a spiritual um, person that you're going to, if it's um, secular training, you have to ensure that they have a value system that has no judgment. That even if they don't believe in something, that they are gonna take the perspective of neutrality, but that they truly understand the different roles that people play, they understand the trauma, they understand all the people who can be impacted between the support system, the individual, the children, um, your work, your community activities, like everything that surrounds you in a systemic way that is impacted by the trauma that you're experiencing from the violence in your home, that they're, you know, they're gonna understand to empower you versus to blame you and tell you that you're wrong. Like if you hear anything that's negative, you're repeating the process in the therapeutic situation while you're supposed to be getting counseling. So when you're making a phone call, when you're doing your research online to select who that person is that you'll receive your counseling, ask them if they're familiar with dealing with trauma. Ask them if they're familiar with empowerment counseling. Empowerment counseling is something that is nationwide in regards to working with individuals who experience and sustain domestic violence. Um, also being sensitive to like just the trigger traps because the trigger traps is like what you were talking about with the words and the actions and the things that you do, but it's so many things in the environment that set off that is not just the interaction between someone else, but the interaction that someone has within their brain that is communicating that violence. Yes, yes. And as we're talking about this, and I know we have two more panelists who are getting ready to disappear. Y'all don't think I'm a magician or something, right? <laughs> more panelists who are getting, we have to get ready to make a shift, and we are going to come back and talk about the religious institution pieces. I definitely want to give a couple more statistics and just definitions of abuse, because there's one type of abuse which was mentioned, but it kind of got overlooked, and it happens very often. And there's a song that comes to my head by one of Philadelphia's own, Jasmine Sullivan, what, go ahead, I see What's people's hands open. I'm going to point to your windows. I'm going to bust the windows out your car. Right? <laughs> and so there's stalking. And stalking is a type of abuse. And it happens a lot. And, you know, many times it gets overlooked as a type of violence. But stalking is a type of violence. And some of the statistics around that is that one in six women and one in 19 men in the United States have experienced stalking victimization at some point during their lifetime in which they felt very fearful or believed that they or someone close to them would be harmed or killed. Two thirds of female victims of stalking were stalked by a current or former intimate partner. Men are primarily stalked by an intimate partner or acquaintance, repeatedly receiving unwanted telephone calls, voice, or text messages was the most commonly, excuse me, commonly experienced stalking tactic for both male and female victims of stalking. An estimated 10.7% of women and 2.1% of men have been stalked by an intimate partner during their lifetime. And we end up using that word stalking. How many times do we even hear children or teens talk about stalking? And we use it so commonplace 
that it loses really the essence and the power and the dangerousness behind it. Oh, I'm gonna just stalk him. Don't worry, I'm gonna get my girlfriend to help me too. Girl, I saw him over there. And this and that. And next thing you know, you surrounded his car, and then next thing you know, his car has new um, designs on it that he did not purchase or ask you to put on there. And so, but this is a form of abuse. They don't know that it's happening and people are doing it. And so we have to understand when we go back to the root definition of abuse, that it is power and coercion over someone. We have to go back to that definition. And then, so what do we do to flip it? What do we do to flip it? And that's what we're gonna talk about on the other side, establishing those healthy relationships. How can the church, how can the synagogue, how can the mosque, how can these forms of spirituality, how can they help? How can our support systems help? So we're gonna take a break. We're gonna come back with Mike Andreas, who's gonna give us one step, which is learning self-defense, all right? And then after that, we're gonna close out with the panel discussion. All right, so we'll be back shortly on Dr. Walls and Friends. Orishashi, ti gbogbo mi ni yo nbo ti wo si bo fun ti a si ngba agbara lowo nwo an lu agbara nwo lati sise iyanu she's here just died to meet you. Welcome back to Dr. Walls and Friends, and I am standing here with a man who I've talked to many times and just found out that I have been pronouncing his name wrong the entire time. <laughs> That's okay. And it's like one of the things that we talked about and we just talked about on the panel is that, and we were talking off screen, as how once you find out that you're doing something that's not correct, the importance of acknowledging it. So this is my acknowledgement. I haven't been pronouncing his name wrong. And then make the correction, right? So I've been saying Mike Andreas. I don't know why. I think I like the way it flows off my tongue. <laughs> I like it too. And I've been doing it for like three years now. Yeah, yeah. And he's sweet and he's like, I never told you, but by the way, <laughs> it's Mike Andres. Andres. And it's just, it's pronounced just the way it's spelled. I have no idea why I did it, but it's Mike Andrus, and I think it's important to pronounce people's names properly because your name carries an energy with you, and so I want to make sure I'm giving you all the energy that you're supposed to have. All right? So now he's going to teach us some self-defense techniques. He's also going to have a helper come up in a few I moments. Sure am, yes. All right? And then who knows, I might come back and do a little... Sure, I might song. be able to pick on some other people. Exactly. So, so. All right. Thank you so much. You're welcome. So thank you all. My name is Mike Andrus. I've um, been doing self-defense for uh, many, many, many years. I've been teaching for about 25 years. Um, military and law enforcement, I've studied many, many different types of martial arts. Hardcore, really hard, serious stuff. And I noticed that there are a lot of lifers like me that style, pr practiced one style. If you think about that in life, they practice one style. And that's all they believe in. And it's just got to be this way. So I studied this one style and it didn't, didn't do it for me and then I st studied another and another and another. So I studied multiple styles of martial arts. And when we talk about domestic violence and physical abuse, we talk about usually if it's bullying or not, one person may be this big, one person's this big. So it's never usually a fair fight. So I took what I believe was the best of all the different martial arts styles and incorporated them into things that I thought would be most effective for some people, whether it was male, female, bigger, smaller, stronger, weaker. Not always the case, but it certainly helps. But I wanted to go over a couple of tools 
and I don't want to be offensive to anybody, but, and by the way, I want to acknowledge, first of all, everybody for being here and give credit to the men and women that were here and some of the folks that made some acknowledgements and said, hey, this was wrong, I want to atone, and I want to make a difference. That's, that's really heavy duty stuff, and that, that means a lot to me hearing that, that uh, the first uh, way to improve yourself is understanding that there was a problem and, and making a resolve on that. So what, we're just going to talk about some things, some tools that you can use. Now I just don't, I want to let you know, you know what, all, what this is here. So this is some serious stuff and there are license to carry and all those things, but I just want to let you know. So I go down from this and do training with this and this is here and it comes up and we're here. So we don't need to engage. So if somebody's giving me a hard time and they're 20 feet away and I'm here and I can yell a command out and say, hey, if you take, any, you take another step closer towards me, it's my understanding that you're here to kill me, I'm gonna defend myself. So that's one method. But if you look at the statistics of who feel comfortable with this tool, very, very few people. Hard to get, and boy, once you have it out, this tool, and you use it, it could be the end of your life if you're not using it properly. So I just want to let you know that's something that's available but not used a lot. Then we throttle down to something, and we were talking about Dr. Walls and I, when I train women for many, many years, they don't like metal and really sharp things. And, you know, what I carried, I said, oh, you, you're comfortable with, you know, this? And, oh, no, it's metal and it's really sharp and, and, and it's, it's, it's just dangerous and, you know, you, you have to hold it properly. So what I do is I recommend and suggest a different type. It's actually vulcanized plastic. And I handed it around to a couple of the females earlier and the one female wouldn't touch my knife and went, oh, no, that's really sharp. And I went, how about this? She grabbed it and went, yeah, this isn't bad. Well, this is the same thing, and it's, and it's long, and it gets into those organs. So I just want to let you know there are tools. So I'm going from the ones that you can use for, for the um, uh, farthest away to things that you may want to implement. You can use this in cold, hot, stick it in the fridge, put it in a planner, have it on you at all times. But it's a good tool, and if you know how to use this tool, it can certainly help you because not everybody is good with the hands. And by the way, statistically, it usually doesn't end up this way, where two people are standing here. It's somebody that doesn't know it's coming, or we're face to face, and we're going to do a little bit of that in a minute. But then I want to tell you, I want to show you a couple other things. This is a little pen that I carry, right? I carry it here, but it's really not. It's a little mace. So this is really nice where you have the pen and you say, look, I, I don't want a problem with the fan in the face. That's one way to get it over with. And I'll tell you, when somebody's cloudy and the mucous membranes are up, and then you have your choice, and I'm going to say this now, and I'll probably say it again when Ann comes up, and I'll probably say it again when Dr. Walsh comes up. If you have to defend yourself, you have one shot, it's round one, you better finish it. Because if you go halfway or a quarter of the way, and that person can get up, and that person is still in the room, you're not going to win round two. So you need to send that warning shot out and it needs to be a big one to say, look, I'm not here to play. This is wrong. You're touching me. This, is, this wasn't meant to be touched. I'm not giving you permission. Right? So no permission means no. No means no. I'm 53 years old. I remember when no meant no. Then there was a little thing where no meant yes. Then they weren't sure. No means no. Right? There's another thing, a little tactical pen that I carry too, that has a little DNA grabber, I call it, on the end. And it's very sharp and you can have it just as a pen and you know you can do a lot of damage with that. But I also want to show you a pepper spray that I have that's called the runner. And it goes on your hand. And so when you're in the supermarket or wherever you are and you have this on your hand, you can use your hands this way and you can also use your hands where you're on the cell phone, if you're there and something happens, you can drop that and you have it right here. And you can carry your purse and you can carry your bag. So I wanted to let you know that. Um, is my, uh, the little purse in the back, could you grab that for me too? So I want to also show you something else. So this looks nice and sturdy and, and you know, it's really funny. Just feel that real, you'd be surprised how light that is, right? So this is the same, it's a, this is this long and it's the same weight but I'll tell you what, this is what everybody does. This is what everybody was taught. So I know where this is coming. If I looked at you and said, here it is, you'd say, you'd know where it's coming. 
If I went like this, you know where it's coming. If I went like this, you know where it's coming. So I teach this to where, hey, look, I don't want a problem. You don't know where it's coming, do you? Right? So I do teach a lot of this. These are nice to have as well. And let me tell you something. This is an extension of your arm. You can hit, and I'll tell you what, it, it can even the score. So I do a lot with these weapons. And I also have a book available, and we'll talk about that later. But let's get into some of the things. Anne, would you mind coming up? She brought my purse from Limited 2 as well. I just want to make one tip. So this is Anne. This is the love of my life here. It's my girlfriend, Anne. Thank you for participating with me. I wanted to make a mention of something that this is a domestic violence and domestic awareness. But if you are on the subway or on the train or on a bus at a bus station or on the street and you're carrying your purse, do so if you're right handed. Let's see the right handies in here. Don't carry it on your right arm. Put it on your left side because this is the more coordinated hand that's connected to the more coordinated foot. And if somebody says, what do you mean? Well, you can fight a lot better and push off and push away and jab and gouge and choke with your more coordinated hand. And if you don't believe me, everybody that just raised their hand that was right-handed, go home and brush your teeth with your left hand and then call me tomorrow. Let me know how that worked out for you. So this is a purse here and it has your stuff or you may have your ring from your mom or your necklace, and, and, and if somebody is demanding that, give it to them. No worldly possession is worth fighting over for your life. And we talk about the purse. Hey, give me your purse. Here you go, that's wrong. Hey, give me your purse. Take it, that's wrong. Hey, give me your purse. Here, you can have it, that's wrong. Let me tell you what's right about this. Hey, give me your purse. I look around, I can escape that way, I can't escape this way. That's right. I want to send my stuff that direction as far as I physically can so that person goes over and gets the stuff while I'm going this way. If you throw your stuff that way and they don't go that way, you have a different problem. <laughs> uh, you have a big problem and it becomes that. So I wanted to go over a few things in the book. There are many, many things, and I won't get into the on-the-ground stuff here. It's not the right forum for it, but one of my expertise is jiu-jitsu on the ground. And ladies and gentlemen, the domestic violence isn't always a slap fight or a punch fight. It's being held down, suffocated, pressed, pressure points. You need to be able to immediately get out of being underneath somebody that's much bigger and stronger. So. I have a volume two coming out, I talk about that, but if anybody wants to talk about that and, and I do seminars all over the place, we can do that. But I just want to show, and Anne has been lovely to, to, to be here to help me. So, so here's Anne here, I just want to show you some things. Now look, I'm bigger than Anne. I don't want to punch somebody in the forearm and the bicep and the chest. I want to be very, very direct and, and, and I want to take things out that hurt, correct? immediately. So this is the CPU, this is the brains of the outfit right here. If I'm punching this person in the arm, it doesn't hurt. But there are spots in the face that are pressure points. There's a notch right on the jaw here. This is called number five. So she grits her jaw. If I hit that spot and I can, and off camera we can do that, I can show you. That is a good place to hit right on the jaw. You can hit it with that knife. You can hit it with the end of a knife. You can hit it with a stick. You can hit it with your hand this way, your hand this way. But here's what I don't want to see. When you do this, and you say, yeah, come on, what does this mean? What does this mean to you? You want to fight. I don't want to fight. Perpetrators, rapists, thugs, bullies, use the element of surprise. They use darkness. They use deceit. They lie cheat, they do immoral and unethical things. Hey, can you help me with my dog? You have a little dog chain, can you help me find my dog? Or hey, listen, my back is dead, can you help me in my car? You know what, I have a map here, could you help me find my way? Can you come over here with the... All of these things are deceitful, unethical, immoral, and they're the element of surprise. So I want to use the element of surprise. So by the way, having my hands up like this, this is surrender, right? 
used to be surrender. So I want to put my hands and my thumbs this way. So if I'm talking to the perpetrator and you're saying, hey, give me, I'm here, I, I have my hands out of my way, but my thumb here, where is my thumb? My thumb's ready to go where? In the eye socket. Now, if somebody's going to take these off, and somebody's going to take this off, and the bra, and the panties, and the pants, and I have the opportunity to get my thumb and stick it in somebody's eye socket to prevent that, who here can physically do that right now and say, I can do it? Who here thinks maybe I'm going to have a problem with that? Anybody? Okay, so thank you for being honest. So now the more graphic scenario, but we're all adults and I'll, I'll be genteel about it is, if you didn't do that, the next thing that happened was you may have gotten choked out, punched in the eye socket, hair pulled, now you're turned around, pants are down and off, and you're being violated. And by the way, after that, it's not a thank you, it could be a slit of your throat, it could be another punch in the back of the head, it could be drug along the floor by your hair. You only have one second to respond to that. And so that's called staying in the moment. That's what the book's called. You don't have five minutes to say, hmm, now I don't know, these little hairs on the back of my neck are standing up, and I don't feel right about this, but I think I'll just stay here for another minute and talk to this guy and make eye contact. So never ever make eye contact at all because I will tell you that when you make eye contact, it takes you out of your game. Isn't that right? I've got this down to about 14 feet. This is 11. I was cheating. It's a little closer. But I can tell you that when somebody stares at you and you stare back, you forget everything else. So if you train, and Dr. Walls and I talked about this, if I teach you and you learn something and you can't apply it, throw it out the window. You have to be able to apply what you learn. So I always tell people to look at the tip of the nose. You can still see what the face is doing, you can still see what the arms are doing, but it's going to be able to have you continue to breathe and focus on that. So Anne is here being nice enough to be my uke. There are other spots. What I like to do is I like to shut off the spinal cord so that the knees don't work. And I do that through the hand. You, you're laughing. You, can you come up here for a second, please? Just for a second. Come on. I know you, you, I know you can do it. Oh, that, come on, you can do it. And you're off the hook. Come on up here for a second. There, look at this guy. All right. Can you? So, come on. Here we go. So stay right here. Now, look, now, now relax. So, so what I'm saying is there's just little techniques to where I'm taking that and I'm taking that spinal cord out, right? Right? I'm sticking it out, right? He's all right. Look. look. I just don't have this finger. I've got this and I'm cutting down on this a little bit, right? And here... And right. now, now look, I, look where I have his head. So stand up. How tall? You about oh, six, goodness. six feet? Yeah. Five, well, look how big this guy is. He's a lot bigger than I am. Got nothing to do right now. <laughs> but look, let me show you something. So here's a hand oh, on a hand on a woman's this chest. Is hurt. No, no, you're gonna be all right. <laughs> hand, hand on a woman's chest. What's the first thing, ladies, that you do? A perfect stranger putting somebody's hand on your chest. It's interesting. Do you? So here's one, that's one, maybe that's what you do. What do you think, what would you do? Oh, just chop and all this stuff and I hear all these fancy things and you know what the first thing you do statistically? Watch, ready? Because you look down, because you're in total disbelief and so what are you taking your eye off of? He's already nervous. What I want to do is, if I do this, then we're separated again for him to go like this. But if I'm not separated and I say to him, ooh, maybe you want to put your, your hand here and I turn ah! the <laughs> Right? Come on back here. I'm doing very nice. So look, I want to keep my, I want to keep his hand. Look, no, stay right here with me. Look, and all I'm doing is, look, I'm just turning this here, right? But look, Come on up here. This guy's fantastic. <laughs> nice, nice spots on the inside. This is called five and six. Make a fist. So you make a fist, right? Look how strong this guy is. Now once you get that one spot, you can control him really nice, right? How's that feel? Tell everybody. Okay, yeah, right? 
So we, so even with the strong guy, make a good fist. She's low. We could just take the, we could take the look the the, the the tendons right in here and shoot the energy right over his ear. It doesn't take a lot of strength. It's just there, right? Oh, wow. And now I have his head here and here and this, here. And this is about and you. Here. Here. So wait, one more. We gotta do. You gotta give him a hand. We got one more right here. Stand right here. No, so. no, that's going not. This is no, this gonna be a good one. So look. I showed you. What is your first name? Dave. Dave, you're sweaty. Dude, you're getting all. Are you, I'm opening up all these energy points. So Dave is not tickling. Dave, no, Dave was a good sport here. So we have number no, no, five. Wait, no, I'm not even doing it. I'm not even doing it. Wait, did that one. So all the nerves in your face come down to number five, and all the nerves on this side. So when I tap Dave before, I shut off this side. And when I tap Dave on this side, I shut off that side. So relax your body. So I just want to show you something. This is how tender and nice it can be. So it's easy. Put your hands down, relax. So if I get Dave on both of these right here, right? Come on. All right, give Dave a hand. Anne's, Anne's loving this because she's off the hook here. Come on, switch sides. So now, I want to show you something. A guy has his hands here, a guy has his hands here, 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 wherever. There's a little line that goes here between the bicep and the tricep that's a nerve right in the middle. Did anybody, when you were little, your little brother, little sister tease, and you got that little pinch in there? Well, if you use your whole hand like you're grabbing a fishing line, and I grab in the middle. Now, I'm not grabbing the tricep, I'm not grabbing the bicep. I'm reaching in on that little nerve in there, and I'm pulling down. So, come on up, right here. You come right up here. Right here. Come on, real quick. You're real easy. I'll do, be very nice to you, because this works out very nice. And thank you for staying right there. So, it's this little nerve right in here. So, if I grab that little nerve, now again, it's the spinal cord doesn't work, so the knees don't work. You know, you're grabbing. It doesn't matter if they have a coat on. It's that little nerve right in that spot right there. You feel it right there? Yeah, right. So you go, you go, you feel how bad that is, right? Now, I'm just touching it a little bit. Had I grabbed that whole nerve in there. Okay, you see what I'm saying? All right, give her a hand. So look, we have number, number five here. Number five here. We have our finger in this part of the of the face that pushes somebody back because look, if they're here, they're trying to take somebody in, and you can get into this and you can do this. So everything in the face is back and down. So if you think about this motion, I'm not just going like this, I'm getting my nail, I'm going and pushing down and back. I'm doing the same thing with the eye socket, down and back. Okay, also with the ear, I'm pulling the ear back and turning, which then puts the person Right? I should have done that to you, Dave. <laughs> okay? Now, I want to show something. Turn this way if you don't mind. I want to show you something that's really important, and we've talked about this. If you're on a bus or a car, you're taking the train, taking the L, whatever, and you like to wear low-cut tops or you like to wear short dresses, you're on your way to a date, a concert, a show, you know what a pashmina is and a wrap. If you have a pashmina with you, you don't have to wear it in the event, you don't have to wear it in the ball, you don't have to wear it on the date. But what happens is, it's these folks out here that are looking at you saying that they're messed up in the head. If I see a beautiful woman, I say, oh, look how pretty she looks, because I'm normal. But somebody else would say, well, she's dressing up for me. Well, she doesn't have a bra on. Well, look how low cut she is. Well, she doesn't have um, stockings on. Well, her dress is cut short. The one way to avoid that is to alleviate yourself and take yourself out of the play by just having a pashmina. If you have a low cut top, just put that on and you have a wrap on. Now there's nothing to see. If you have that and you're good on the top but you have a short dress, just wrap it up so your legs aren't exposed. You can always take it off once you get to where you need to go. But I want to mention something about the hair. So three, yeah, do you have a thing with you or no? Oh, that's okay. So, so let me see here. Uh, three kinds of hairstyles. Up, up a ponytail is one. Oh, you got a, oh, we got a ponytail coming. Fantastic, I want to show you this. So Ann will be number two, and then we have somebody with an updo. You have an updo man right here. That's perfect. I meant to report. 
Are you okay? Well, I'm gonna. I'll just point to you then. Okay. All right, well, no, keep it there. Can you get a big pony? Oh, big pony's perfect right there. Oh. Oh, there you go. Up to there we go. Miss <laughs> Updu, can we use you up here? Sure. So look here. I just want to show you, uh, uh, and I'll start with Dr. Waltz. So let me tell you something. Somebody's running, and they always say, "Now, well, you know, my Mr. Mike, I've gotten better now. I only use one earbud when I'm running. Why would you use any?" You have cars, buses, horns, people yelling fire, earthquake. Hey, look at the guy behind you. Listen to your music at home or on the bus because you're seated and you can kind of see who's around you. Not while you're running past bushes, shrubs, cars, vans. Three kinds of hairstyle. The, when you were a little girl, you had little ponies, little piggies. Then you have a pony now, and she's got a high pony going. Number two hair is just loose and straight, and number three is an updo. If you had these three, let's turn them around this way. This would be good. Yeah, right here. Come over here. Okay, so I'm going to get out of the way. If you had these three, and you didn't want it to pull somebody down, and you were insecure, but you had a power trip problem, and you wanted to rape one of these women, and you saw these three women running, this would not be the ideal. You wouldn't be able to grab it and pull it out. You might miss it. So I wouldn't say that was number one candidate. In that fact, that's the best idea. And she's got beautiful, you have to weave up, and she's got the cornrows up right here. And she's doing really good. It's hard to grab it, may not come out. You're not going to grab it. And by the way, if she, as soon as she feels something, she could pull out of that. You're not going to get a good grip. Number two, I call this the Jerry Springer. You got the fight going on where women grabbing each other's hair. I'm not kidding you. And pulling, and guess what? You can work your way out of it and you'll lose a clump of hair and it'll be sore, but you'll still get out of it if somebody grabs you with the clump. Now, all right, so I'm going to move you guys over. I'm going to bring Dr. Walls in here. You know, I love it. However, turn side, just like this. She has every hair follicle in her head woven together and now pulled together and so all the nerve endings on her entire head are right in this spot right here so i will be as gentle as a lamb but i will tell you what when you have a ponytail you go where your head goes so let me tell you something this is called a ponytail i call it a handle and the first thing and i won't do it if i grab this handle and i yanked it and I'll just simulate. If I pull hard, what is the first thing that hits the back, the concrete floor? What's the first thing that hits it? The back of her what? Do you think she's gonna be able to go like this? No, your hands come this way. Your hands don't go back like that. So now, I don't have to fight her. I just pull her hair. And that's all of this hair beautifully put together for me. And you notice that you can, it just goes, you go where I go. By the way, the other nice thing is, I want to get in here to this neck. So here's the other nice thing. I don't need to touch her neck. I just need to pull here, which gives me really great access to this. And then I'm locked up, and I'm pulling down, and it's all over. Got it? So we still need her. Don't so we still need her. Don't take her away. Oh, yeah, no. All right, give her a hand. Give her Dr. Walls a hand. Thank you, Dr. Walls. So you, you, you kind of get the point, right? So what's well, Okay, so, you know, worst option to medium, how's your hand? All right, I'm gonna, yeah, I'll, how's your hand? All right, you all right? So look, there's a lot of spots that I go over, the hands uh, for pressure points, locking out the wrist, locking the arms out, I do all that stuff. And let me tell you something, I see all these people grabbing each other trying to put somebody down. It's very, very easy one-on-one -on -one to do that. You just have to know where the right spots are. Let me tell you something. Somebody's giving you a hard time. You ever see this choke? Where do you see this choke? It's called the movies. <laughs> this is the movies. This doesn't do anything to you. You're actually constricting your own hands. It's one finger. Picture a little pipe. And you have the pipe right here. Actually, you have it right here. And your hand comes in, and all this finger does is go this way. What is this? your windpipe these fingers are just out of the way and so if you have a big Adam's apple right there you're locking that in so on and uh, this finger just comes in and I can feel it popping in there it'd be nice but that's it so somebody's trying to get on you it's just that one finger on this side turn it in and turn it around and hold it 
and push. That's it. And I was telling you about the ear, that what you do, there's a little bone in the top here. When I pull the ear back and I pop it, all I want to do is pop the ear back and turn. So what happens is I pop the ear back and turn, and I get this. So you didn't really mean to turn that way, did you? So you can turn somebody away from you, and now when they're here, you have the back, you have here, and you can pull them down. But, so there's a lot of different maneuvers I could do this you know, for, for a week and a half, so I just want to wrap up. But a lot of manipulations on the face. If somebody's in here, you can grab this arm in here. And by the way, if somebody's got you with two hands, how many hands do they have left? You got it, and that's when it's time to go to work right there. You can hit that, you can hit this spot right here, then they're gonna bring this up here. Now you're open here, you got this, you have the face, smash the nose. One more quick, I got 10 seconds. Ladies, I heard somebody earlier, knee them in the groin. So this is this close, close contact knee. But if Ann goes to knee me in the groin, I can block it, I can block it because it, it's low enough. What I can't block is a straight leg kick. So nice and neat. I, you'll see that even if I have my hands low enough and she's kicking right up underneath with her toe, and by the way, it happens this fast, right? It's not one of these, well, I gotta get in close and I've gotta do this and I've got a knee because if a guy's in close, we have padding in the front. That's gonna just aggravate me more, or aggravate somebody, and then they're gonna come in here. But I'll tell you what, if you retreat a little bit and the person's talking to you, and, and that comes up super fast, I do not have the ability to block that. So that's that kick straight up underneath, and if you have high heels on with that point, it's bad news, but it'll still work. So I know we're running out of time, but I wanna thank you uh, for having me. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. And before I let you off camera, I do want people to know that he has his book, Staying in the Moment, back there for sale, $10. Thank you, yes, okay. and I'll sign a copy for yes, you. Yes, and it's very practical tips for you to use, as well as with language. And yes. if you could just do the quick demonstration of going on vacation. Oh, sure, so each technique has a name. The wedge, and I have one called Going on Vacation, we've talked about this. So the last seminar I did, 11-year-old girl, and I looked at her and said, what's your name? She said, Kathy. I said, Kathy, let me teach you how to go on vacation. Do you know? And she said, sure, let me, let me learn. I said, okay, so we're gonna open the door, we're gonna reach down for our luggage, and we're gonna pick it up. So we're going on vacation. So we're gonna open the door, we're gonna reach down for our luggage, and we're gonna pick it up. So if Dr. Walls is there, we're gonna, we're gonna open the door, right into the chest cavity right here. We're going to- I think to, David wants to come up for this. Hey, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> so what it is, it's a rear elbow to the solar plexus, a hammer fist to the groin, and then this hand slides right up underneath the neck. And that's going on vacation. So about two hours later, I saw her and I said, hey, can you show me how to go on vacation? She went, because she just remembered going on vacation. She didn't remember you know, rear elbow to the solar plexus, hammer fist to the groin, and up elbow to the, to the larynx. She didn't know that. So there's the wedge, there's going on vacation, there's the windmill, so they're all named. And even if you're with somebody, you can say, hey, go on vacation, or whatever. You can talk to each other, there's cues. But tons of practical um, uh, tips in the book as yes. well. So yes. thank you so much. Thank you so much, and please be sure to go back. Thank you. And you can check out Mike, and if you need him to come do some seminars at your job, at your churches, at your religious affiliations and so to. forth, women's groups, he does all of that. I do. And he travels around the world doing this. Thank so you can get his contact information. Welcome back to Dr. Walls and Friends. And we have a few minutes left in the show. We thank you so much for staying with us throughout this panel discussion. It has truly been a rich day of awareness as well as healing and enjoying our vendors who are here and audience members and we just had a great demonstration by Mike Andrus and self-defense and so now back to you three are really healers in this process and working with the community in different ways and so as we get ready to close out I want you to talk about what are some of the ways in which you can help the community? So helping those who have experienced domestic violence firsthand, as well as helping to prevent it to continue, or from continuing, excuse me. Well, I'd like to 
the latter portion of your introductory remarks. <clears throat> I think preventative measures are are the best measures to take. I think, especially from a, um, a religious perspective, a, a person who's a, uh, a ministry uh, a practitioner, um, it's a little too late when a sister or a brother comes to the church or comes to the institution and says that I've experienced this. And so I feel that taking early preventative steps are probably the best way to combat this, this heinous illness in our, in our culture. And that starts with children and watching and being very meticulous about what they are exposed to, what video games they play. Uh, there's por a portion of my family, an aunt that I have, who for the longest time, our side of the family didn't think that she and her husband ever argued. We, we didn't think that they ever had any disagreements and they've been married for well over 60 years. And if you would engage them about how peaceful their relationship looks. And they'll tell you that they argued probably more than other couples. They did, they did it in the, in the basement, out of the sight of all the children. And they wanted their children to see them argue. They didn't want their children to see uh, uh, what, what that looked like or what that could spiral into. Such measures, I feel, are very important. And from an institutional standpoint, I really feel that we have to, as leaders, dispel this notion of human hierarchy because hierarchy connotes control. Um, so this man is greater than a woman, or protector, and all these other things, and a woman, well, she's, she has a role, and it's usually one of subservience, and homemaker, and all these things. We have to dispel the notion that one is greater than the other, and that we're all equal. And me hitting you because I'm a man and you're a woman, that's not really the wrong thing. What's wrong is me hitting you in the first place. Violence is the problem. And so we need a, a very potent injection of love. And just to play back on the hierarchy argument, my grandmother, I, I remember, as, as most of us here have heard growing up, that behind every good uh, man is a good woman. And I remember as a kid uh, telling my grandmother that with regard to my grandfather. Oh, you, you behind him, grandma. That's right, you behind him, grandma. He's such a good guy, you, you, you behind him. And she shut me up mid-conversation one day and told me, no, beside every good man is a good woman. You know, God, when he created woman, he didn't pull her pull uh, 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 her from the hand of man so that we could hit her, or when he, he, didn't pull her, he didn't pull her from the back of man so that she'd be behind us or the foot of man so that we would walk over her, but he pulled her from the side. And so that, that, that connotes that, that there's something equal should be at play. And so we should we hone in on these ideas that we're all equal and that we're all human and that to hit each other, no matter of race, no matter of, of, of gender, that it's just wrong to hit people, it's just wrong to emotionally abuse people, it's wrong uh, to, to speak uh, of anyone when it's outside of the context of love. And so we, and from, from our institution's perspective, we have to re hone in on those points. And I'd like to just take this last little portion to say that, you know, in religion, there was a, a very, a very long period of history because we talked about character traits and what they've evolved into, uh, where where women were regarded as as the, the the high jewels of society, where actually most human civilizations regarded God as woman, right? Because for, and this plays back to what our uh, uh, brother Imam said earlier, you know. Women give birth. Women, women are, you know, they, they are, they, they, life starts inside the woman's womb. And so for, for a very long period of history, all human civilizations said, well, God has to be a woman because the woman gives life and all life form wouldn't exist if it weren't for a woman. So God has to be a woman. The, the day man woke up and realized that it was his sperm that fertilized the egg, God, boom, became a man. <laughs> and all of a sudden, you know, we, we had these various uh, 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 sexes, sexism, man over the woman, this, that, and third. These arguments have come into play, and as a consequence, we've seen a lot of a lot of things unfold in our society that has. So if we dispel the human hierarchy and preach from our pulpits or wherever our spaces of, of, of religion, religious devotion uh, is, that love is the common denominator among us all, and that none of us are greater, um, and, and that God really doesn't have any gender specifications in terms of who God loves. And so even when we refer to our deity, 
You know, even when I refer to God, I always say God. I, I don't. I, I don't even say He, right? <laughs> because I feel that that if, if God were to be anything, uh, God is God is a spirit, right? God is a spirit. So I don't want to go on a tangent, but yes, okay. if, if we if we do that, if we rethink this whole idea of human hierarchy, um, if we if we hone in on love and and and, and regard love as that great equalizer among us all, then I think that we can really get the wheels turning on how to create a more peaceful society uh, with regard to relationships. We all stand. Yeah, yeah. And, and again, you see, that is one of the keys. And that's the most important key for individual achievement of the spirituality. But we, sometimes we lose the key to what success is. When we look at uh, people's feelings of inadequacy, that may be what precipitates conflict, uh, especially in close relationships, and then it precipitates a, a need to be defensive and then even offensive. Uh, and so, you know, what we try to do is let uh, our congregants know that there are three institutions of life that have nothing to do with your success. It may make you feel inadequate. We got the politics or community and social. We have the educational and we have economic. And so these are areas that um, people have to continue to develop in because those are things that you bring as resources to relationship. But the thing that is the most important between the man and the woman or in the home is the culture and the culture is the religion uh, because it determines how you eat it determines how you re respond to each other. It even determines what rights you have over each other. And, and the rights are common rights. And they aren't really even civil or human rights, but they're divine rights, meaning that they're God-given. I think even in the, uh, the, the declaration, we hold these truths to be self-evident. So um, the thing we try to hone in on is we need all the keys in a relationship. And when a person is deprived of some of the keys, he feels inadequate. Yes. And we do know that there's a colonized male syndrome. <laughs> when if a male feels that he's not a man, if everything else is taken, the only thing he has is his macho. Yes. And so we see a tendency in some cultures for the macho man. We see a tendency in others, uh, you know, they have what they call honor killings. And so right. these are when uh, men are colonized by their own tribal yes. relationships. And most of those tribes are patriotic. And though that's really a, a, a paradigm that's outdated. But we can't speak on that, but all we can say is this. The culture that is in the home has to be based if you are, if, you, if the family is a faith-based institution, it has to revolve around uh, God, and it has to revolve around, you know, just what God expects from you. Not what you expect from your mate. Mm. You give God what he expects from you to your mate. Mm. If they don't give it to you, you have to ask God for it. Mm. <laughs> because he's the one who can change the hearts. Yes. And so, so I would say that, and I would like to conclude with this. Um, sometimes we focus on where the light is shown. Uh, and you know, we have a tendency, and especially in the media driven society, wherever they put the light at, that's where everybody goes. And there was a mad bull up, and he was running around at midnight in the dark, looking. And a friend of his came along and said, What are you looking for? He said, I lost my keys. So he's standing under a street light looking for his keys. He said, But did you lose them here? He said, no, I lost him over there. He said, well, why are you standing here? He said, because this is where the light is. <laughs> See, sometimes we don't go to where we need to go. Yes. And that's within ourselves. In yes. the darkness of our own hearts, the darkness right. of our own minds, but we only go to where the light mm -hmm. is shown. Yes. And I think we have a tendency to do that. So the, the, um, the light is shown on people's education, their what they bring in, the economics, it's just what they do socially. Mm -hmm. But that's not where we need to look for the key to success. We need to go within the darkness of our own hearts, our own minds, and really see 
what does God expect from me? And, uh, you know, prayer is a part, a very important part of a home, a home life. Uh, and so we, we try to encourage people to use your home as a faith-based institution. And use your home as a place where you really find, or you're looking for peace of mind, where you can leave all the problems of the world outside, don't bring the economics in, don't bring the politics in, don't bring that in. And if you can be successful in connecting with your faith, that's the best thing you can have as far as achievement goes in this world. Uh, and that a saying in the prophet here that all the things that you have in the world, the best thing to have is a good thing. And I like to say I have one sitting in the audience. Right. <laughs> so she right. helps me keep these things. And Miss Mary right. May, marriage and family therapist who helps people keep good mates. Yes, 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 all day long. I would like to talk, think about equal sacrifice and equal experience and trying to blend in what the spiritual leaders on the panel with me have shared, the equal sacrifice would help you define what your role is. So we have society that says that women cook and they clean or they do certain things and the men goes out and they provide and, and they have their specific role. But sometimes it's about equal sacrifice and it's not about the image or what people believe you know, the role should be within your home. You have to define what that looks like within your home and be confident in that and once you do that you live in a space of excellence on how your home is valued equal experience or sacrifice from an experience aspect is exposure to resolving conflict in a healthy way is necessary because when you think about you building the, the family system and you build in how they deal with things outside how they resolve conflict, how they deal with differences, how they deal with someone disagreeing or delaying their gratification and saying no, they learn that from the context within their home. So if they don't see that within the home, like I think it's phenomenal that you mentioned your family member that was married for 60 years but they didn't experience anything negative in their relationship. And not so much that I'm saying I'm encouraging the violence, but I'm encouraging peaceful resolution. Like being able to demonstrate that, like you can have the the rah rah things out of sight, but if it once you get it beyond the rah rah moment, and you're able to take a moment to say, okay, let me look at this in a different way, and demonstrate for my children, or demonstrate for my grandchildren, or demonstrate to my mate that I'm able to have a peaceful and safe conversation, then you're able to begin the healing process because you have to make sure that your spirit is in a space of excellence before you can resolve anything. One thing I did do is make a, a acronym for healing. Yeah. Um, for healing, I said the first thing would be honesty. To use the H to be honest with yourself and make realistic expectations in regards to what it is that you want for yourself from an individual's perspective as well as within the world. To have, be educated about what your experience in domestic violence is, be it the financial, the sexual, the emotional, and as you said earlier, having children or not having children, reproduction um, abuse, being educated about what your experience is, as well as being educated about what counseling can really look like. Because counseling is not necessarily judgmental, but that person is a coach to help guide you through that supportive situation. Um, acceptance that, okay, I'm here. If you accept the fact that you have made it to this place of an unsafe relationship, then you can better get to a place of removing yourself from denial and moving forward to the healing aspect. Love yourself and love those around you. When you love yourself, you can make a better and clear plan on how you can become safe either verbally and or physically, as well as be intentional and purposeful in your actions. When you're trying to escape an unsafe situation, you have to be intentional as well as purposeful, but you have to make sure that who you determine that you're going to trust is a person that's going to also maintain your safety as opposed to exposing it even further. The end for numb, numb the noise of distraction. People in society will say, girl, you better stay in that relationship, that's a good man. Or all your bills are paid, why would you want to leave this situation? Numb the noise, numb the distractions, because no one knows your experience of sacrifice. And if your emotional spirit is not healthy and healed, you need to eliminate and numb the noise. And last, go. Go in a spirit of, of excellence. Go in a spirit of where you will be safe and protect not only you, 
but everybody around you. Because the thing about healing is that it's not just you as the victim, it's everyone who has been in your support system, everyone who has provided some level of support to you, be it on the phone, through the text messages, you going to their home for a couple days and going back. Like how you decide to go needs to be very careful, but be intentional and be purposeful to create the safety. I thank you. I thank all of you for being on the panel. I thank the audience members for being with us today. And it's so important that we have these conversations to raise the awareness, as well as raise the awareness of the solutions that are out there and the resources that are out there. And you three are definitely resources to people in the community. And this is just the beginning. This is the first part of a healing series which we will be doing. And so we'll, we'll further these conversations. So this was kind of like a little taste, like a buffet of all the different topics we will be talking about because we'll also be talking in the future about the lesbian, gay, transgender community as well and the domestic violence that takes place within that community. We'll be looking further into the religious institutions and how it's handled in further conversation there. We'll be talking about healthy relationships and what do healthy relationships look like so as you start down a path and you start to experience things and you say, wait a minute, this is not the street that I intended to go down. How do I stop, back up, and get off the street and go in a different direction? You know, so many times we live and ascribe to philosophies or statements and then try to make them work. So anybody ever heard of, well, I made this bed, I might as well lie in it. Okay, get up, take the sheets off, throw them away, change the bed. If you gotta throw the mattress away, do that too. So you can change at any point in time. And we know when we're talking about domestic violence situations that there also takes planning in that. And so my mother always had a statement that said, plan your work, work your plan, plan your escape, and work that escape. There are resources out there online, as well as within the community. There are safe houses. There are different ways in which we can help our neighbors with telephones. There's so many go phones that are out there now that you can hold it for them when they need it. And as community family members, sometimes it's just a matter of patience because we want them to get up and go, but we have to recognize that they are account, they're thinking about their children, they're thinking about where are they going to sleep because there is a large amount of homelessness which is due to people leaving domestic violence situations. So just getting up and going sometimes, as much as we want to say that that's the answer, is not the reality for the people living in it. And so on this day, we thank you, we thank you, we thank you for raising the consciousness, for raising the awareness, for raising the healing, for raising the peace, and for raising the love. As one person said, it does not take 100% to tip the scale, it only takes 51%. So we do our part in tipping that scale of 51% towards support, towards peace, towards love, and towards harmony. Thank you for joining us today on Dr. Wells and Friends, and we'll see you again real soon. He oh, watching Dr. Dr. Walls and, and Friends, friends what? on UCCN. Keep this. He watching Dr. Walls and, and Friends, friends what? on UCCN.tv. There it is. What?